Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop, Dedicating Managed Care Systems in Minnesota, uh, advice from an insider. My name is Patrick Robinson uh, from, from the Alumni Association. Uh, thank you for coming. And before we begin, I'd just like to ask people to check their cell phones and uh, turn them off until like 5.30, uh, since this workshop is being recorded. Uh, very important, and we thank you for your cooperation. I'm also, there are many handouts uh, in the back on the table, and also there's some, uh, uh, the workshop survey. So if you could take some time to uh, complete that, um, that would be great. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce the presenter of the workshop. Um, Jennifer Edlon is a current, current student here, and Jennifer has worked in a behavior managed care organization for about 10 years. Currently, she works for Behavior Healthcare Providers, PHP, and Managed Behavior Services for Preferred One and UCARE insurance companies. Um, Jennifer? Thanks. Hello, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so, and there is a number of handouts on the back. I don't know if everyone grabbed all of them, but uh, as we go through the presentation, if there's one you don't have, feel free to go grab it. Um, so, um, my name is Jennifer Edlin. Um, I'm a second year student here at Adler Graduate School. I only have a couple classes left before I'm done, and this is part of my master's project. Um, so, um, I have seen in my work over the last 10 years, obviously I've worked with a lot of different providers, and a lot of different levels of care and that kind of thing. And the, the thing that I see that's most frustrating is that um, providers don't know how to work with managed care. Um, and they don't, so then they feel like they don't know what to do or they feel like it's a barrier to them providing care. And it doesn't really have to be that way. It's not as hard as people think. So my whole goal of doing this presentation is just to help people understand a little bit more about managed care, about what they're looking for, and help you guys maybe find easier ways to work with managed care companies so that they're not so that it doesn't become a barrier to, to you providing care, it becomes more of a, um, even a helpful service or, you know, there's things that they can help you do too. So, um, yeah, so just a little bit about me. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to say too is that in most um, schools that I'm aware of, uh, graduate schools, there's not training about how to work with managed care companies and insurance companies. So students, when they complete school, they're thrown out and they're going into their own you know, private practice or they're working for a clinic and they just don't know any of these things. And so for them to try to figure it all out on their own, um, I think is, is usually a pretty tough thing. Um, and the other thing I would say is I, I see a couple students, I know there's a couple of faculty here. I'm assuming probably some of the rest of you are providers already, current providers or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, everyone that's here probably has their own different um, background and experience of working with insurance companies and managed care. So not everything I say is going to be useful to everybody, but um, you know, hopefully some piece of the presentation will have meaning for different people here. Um, and if you have questions as we're going along, you can feel free to ask me. Um, usually the, the discussion that these kind of presentations generate is just as interesting and informative as the presentation itself, I found. Um, and I did, one of the handouts is a list of definitions. I don't know if everyone grabbed that or not. Um, but that, I was going to put it in the PowerPoint, but it's, it's kind of a long list of definitions. So if you have that, if there's something that I'm talking about that doesn't make sense, um, take a look on that sheet and you'll probably find on there just a basic definition of what it is. Um, and if you have questions about that, I guess I'd be to ask. Okay, so just real brief, I want to talk a little bit about the history of managed care. Um, I won't talk too long about this because it's something you could go on for quite a long time. Um, right now, the most common kinds of, of managed care or insurance organizations are HMOs. Um, health maintenance organizations or PPOs, preferred provider organizations, and managed care usually involves three components, um, oversight of care given, um, contractual relationship and organization of the providers giving care, and then the, gov the um, covered benefits that are tied to managed care rules. Um, the term managed care was coined in about the 1980s, but HMOs started up back about in the 1920s. Um, they weren't called HMOs until 1970s, but it was in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s that people started to form kind of health insurance plans and health insurance benefits and form groups of that kind. Um, and then it was kind of in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that managed care kind of evolved and people started doing oversight and management of services and um, then it kind of turned into what it is um, today. Um, 
there's a lot of, I mean, if you want to look up just Google, like HMOs or PPOs, there's tons of information out there about how they came about, about, you know, what all the different services mean. But I think in general, all that you really need to know is um, there's insurance companies. Some of them manage their own services. Um, some of them um, hire other companies to manage their services for them, their behavioral services. So like health partners, um, they do their own, all their own internal management, whereas like UCARE, um, the company I work for, we're hired to manage their behavioral services for them. So there's differences even in how the companies are set up and who does the management, um, and that's part of the reason why um, I think that there's so many different requirements and it's different for every insurance company. It's just because there's a lot of different companies out there and they're all set up quite a bit differently. Um, so um, just to point to uh, managed care organizations um, are managed themselves by um, usually state guidelines or by a company called NCQA. So there is oversight of managed care companies, so we'll kind of go into this a little bit later, but if you're running into a situation where you feel like something's really unfair or um, you're having lots of problems with a company, there are places that you can go to reach out to like an insurance commissioner or to um, NCQA that does quality management of, of managed behavioral companies, and they can help you with problems that you feel like you need to escalate. So even though um, I think a lot of providers sometimes feel like managed care companies do their own thing and they don't care about what anyone else thinks or that kind of thing. It's not necessarily the case. Managed care companies are governed by other entities just like any other com company would be too. Um, there's lots of trends in managed care um, or in terms of the level of management or the level of oversight. It seems to kind of go up and down. Um, there was a big lawsuit, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago with Blue Cross and that kind of pushed um, management and oversight downwards, but um, since then I've kind of seen it go up sometimes and down sometimes. So, I mean, things are always changing in managed care and insurance, and that's one of the things I'll talk about later too, is that you have to have a good way of keeping track of what the changes are and a good way of keeping yourself current on what the different kinds of requirements are. Um, and then, so in Minnesota right now, there's a um, couple different kinds of insurance companies. There's commercial insurance companies, which is like Preferred One, Medica, Blue Cross, um, Health Partners, patient, Patients Choice. These are companies, they're usually, usually businesses will hire these companies to um, provide their insurance benefits for different people. Um, because they're commercial, um, they have a, a, an ability to kind of make their own rules um, and regulations in terms of what is a covered benefit or what is not, or they might work with the employer to, to determine um, you know, how much mental health coverage they want to have or if they want to have. The other kinds of insurance are um, like state public programs, which would be MA, Minnesota Care, um, or um, Minnesota Senior Care, um, special needs programs, which is like um, MSHOW or the Connect programs, and those can be administered by different companies. So you could have MA, but you might have it through UCARE or you might have it through Health Partners. Um, you know, there's different companies that manage those. And although they are a little bit different, um, anytime you're dealing with a state-funded insurance, um, basically it's going to be the rules that are outlined by the Minnesota Department of Human Services, um, DHS. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And then there's also Medicare plans and Medicare replacement plans, and those follow the rules of um, Medicare. And those are usually a little bit different um, than the other plans. So there's a lot of different plans out there. All of them are a little bit different. The question and then, uh, I think becomes if you're a, a provider and you're especially in a private practice, how do you figure out all these companies and how do you work with them? Um, and if you have, for example, say a, uh, an insurance that you don't work with very often, it's it doesn't have to be that like every time you do get a client from them that you don't know what to do. You have to f feel like you start off, you know starting all over and that um, it takes you forever to get authorization. It doesn't shouldn't have to be that hard. Um, Okay, so why, why should you care about insurance companies and managed care organizations? Um, you don't need to participate with them. There is an option of private pay. Um, and that is the option where the client pays the provider directly for their services, and then the client then seeks reimbursement for um, the services from the insurance, less than, than any of us would. So, I mean, private pay is an option. There's a lot of, um, there's a fair amount of providers that do it, like I think Roger Ballou does it, um, and I think some other instructors here do it. Um, and so that's certainly an option. If you decide you really don't like managed care and you don't want to work with insurance companies, then you can figure out how to do private pay, and then you bypass that whole thing. Um, the reality is that most providers do have to work with insurance companies for reimbursement, um, and that being the case, if you're in a position where you have to work with insurance companies, you want to figure out a good way to do it, um, and maybe spend a little time, 
learning the different rules and regulations so that it's not as hard on the backside when you're trying to get authorizations and that kind of thing. Um, and I think I've already said this a couple times, but the more you know about um, insurance authorizations, the easier it's going to be. So if you're just thrown into it and you just try to guess what an insurance company is going to want from you or what their focus is, and you send them a whole bunch of paperwork but you don't really know what they want, you're not going to send them the right things. It's not going to be authorized, and then you're going to feel frustrated because you feel like I you don't know what they want. Um, when I took my research class here, I did my literature review on the relationship between um, providers and managed care organizations. And the, in all the research I did for that, I found that the more providers know about managed care organizations, the more positive um, of an attitude they have about it and the easier they work together. And then there's an overall better outcome for client care. So if you're in a position where you have to work with insurance companies and managed care organizations, um, learn as much as you can um, and be proactive about it. And that's what I'm kind of trying to help, help you guys do here today. Um, and then, of course, is working in a private practice. Um, a lot of times if you work in a clinic, a bigger clinic, um, they are going to do a lot of these things for you where they'll tell you how to chart, they'll tell you how to do your progress notes, they'll tell you when you need to update a treatment plan, um, and they'll do the billing for you, they do everything for you, so it's like you don't really have to learn this. Um, some of the biggest problems that I've seen providers have is when they've gone from a clinic to a private practice, all of a sudden they have to do all these things themselves, they don't know what the requirements are, um, and it's just a nightmare. And so. Be aware, even if you're working in a clinic, um, if you're thinking at some point about going to, into a private practice, um, th these kinds of things are the things that you'd want to know about um, and be aware of before you make that change. Okay, so there's three, three basic things that I'm going to talk about in the presentation today. Um, and that's basically the three steps that you have to become familiar with in order to navigate your way through managed care. The first is credentialing or contracting, and that's how you become part of the provider network of a managed care organization. And then the second part we'll talk about is prior authorizations, um, and that's getting approval for your services before you do them so that you can get, get paid for them. And then the third part I'll talk about is billing, um, and then we'll go through some, some tips and stuff like that. So um, in terms of credentialing, or becoming part of a network of providers, like for example where I work at BHP, we have our own network of providers that are contracted um, and credentialed with us. It's usually the same at Health Partners or, I mean, any of the major companies, if you want to see clients that have those insurances, you have to become credentialed and become part of their network. Um, so there is a difference between contracting and credentialing. Some places do both. Some people only do credentialing. Some people only do contracting. So it's very important when you're starting out. Um, say you want to become a provider for Blue Cross. Then you need to go to their website and look and see, do they contract? Do they credential? What are their requirements? Um, and that kind of thing. And just real generally, the difference between contracting and credentialing. Um, credentialing is a specific process um, that you have to fill out an application. It goes through your work history. It goes through specializations, education, um, and specific questions related to personal history. Um, this is how insurance companies determine if they feel like you're a qualified provider to be in their network or a good provider to be in their network. This is where you're talking about what your specializations are, where you work. So the insurance company can look and see, do we have a need for this provider at the location that they're providing services at? Um, a contract is an agreement between the insurance company and the provider that talks about um, how services will be provided, um, what the expectations are, um, and what the requirements are, and what the reimbursement will be. So credentialing is where you go through, you answer questions for the insurance company saying, this is what I do, this is my work history, this is why I'm a good provider, and they determine then if they want you in their network. The contract is then usually later where it talks about, um, this is what we expect of you as a provider, this is you know, what our policy is for um, billing or claims. So there's two different things there that you just want to be aware so of. So in order to become credentialed, um, so what is the process? There is a, a Minnesota Uniform application for, for becoming contracted or credentialed with the um, insurance company, and this is generally done online now. Um, there is a website, it's called credentialsmart.com, and this is a website where you can put in your information, basically go through what's in the, the application, fill it out, and it will send it out to multiple different companies. So that's kind of a neat way where you only have to do it once, and it goes to a bunch of different companies. Um, there are some companies, maybe some smaller ones, that don't work with CredSmart or that you might have to fill out the application separately. Like I said, you just have to kind of go to the website or the company that you want to become a network provider for and figure out what their rules and regulations are. Um, I did print out and bring, this is not in the handouts, but I did print out and bring a copy of the Minnesota Universal application form to become a provider. 
um, and it is a 21 page document or a 20 page document mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not a it's not a small I mean it's a lot of information it to me it kind of looks like what you have to fill out in order to get your license you know with the board it's almost the same kind of thing where you have to ask, answer questions about your work history and even your personal history and um, things like that so I'll pass this around if you want to take a look at it. Did you have a question? Yeah, so if you are already working for a company and you go to private practice, do you have to fill all that out again? Um, it depends. And the other thing that I brought related to that is the Minnesota Universal Practitioner Change Form. So this is what you would fill out and send to a company if you are changing locations, if you're going to a private practice. Um, and this is something... Um, I think it's on the next slide, but that can be different between companies. Some of them, if you're credentialed at one location, or once you're credentialed, you're credentialed at every location you're at. For some of them, if you're credentialed at one location, that does not necessarily mean you're credentialed at another location. But in my experience, for most companies, um, if you're credentialed and you're leaving one place and going to another, you need to fill out this change form um, and send it into the company prior to you leaving or prior to you starting at your new place. Because once you leave a place, and, you get not and, the co and the insurance company gets a notification that you've left, they'll term your contract and you're done um, if you haven't sent this in, and then you would have to start the process all over again, fill out the whole form. But if you know you're gonna be moving or changing practices, I would fill this out and send it to the company. Is that online? That it is online, yep. On that credentials um, On the credentials part, um, it's also, like if you just Google Minnesota Universal credentialing change form, you can find it there too. At the end of the presentation, there's a bunch of websites too, that, that kind of have all these pieces of information on there. Um, I'll pass this around to you. <coughs> um, usually you have to pay for this. Um, if you work for a large clinic, a lot of times the clinic will pay the fee. It's usually like a $125 fee to go through the process. Um, some companies do waive the fee and you don't have to pay. Um, I think if you apply through CredSmart, I think you have to pay a $25 flat fee and that goes out to everyone. But just be aware that, especially if you're in a private practice, you're likely gonna have to pay. Um, in order to become part of the network. And that's because they have to do the background checks and they, I mean, it takes time for them to go through the, the application and process it and that's why there's a fee. Um, the other thing I would say is the process takes a long time. Um, going through credentialing, I mean, if everything is, there's no problems, everything's filled out correctly, I mean, it can be done in, I don't know, the shortest is probably maybe four or five weeks, um, but if there's, stipulations or if there's problems or the application's not filled out correctly, it can take up to four, five, six months. Um, so if you're changing locations or moving to a private practice, that's why you want to make sure you get the ad change form in right away because if you move without doing that, you get termed from the network, um, but you're carrying clients with you from your old practice and you keep seeing those clients, you can't get paid until you're credentialed at your new location. So it's just something to think about if you're moving uh, to a private practice or to a different location, make sure you take care of these things before you move so that you can, if you're bringing clients with you, you can keep billing and seeing them without a problem. Because then if you don't, then you run into the whole, you have to get an out-of-network authorization and that can be kind of its own uh, bad deal. Yeah. So, um, as I said, it'll take longer if you have stipulations. Um, stipulations are on the application. It's things like, have you ever let your um, m uh, malpractice insurance lapse? Have you ever... Um, been convicted of a crime, anything that would cause a red flag that um, they might want to look at the application a little bit closer to make sure that um, everything's okay and that you're appropriate to be providing mental health services. If you have any of those things, those stipulations, it will take a little bit longer. Um, and my advice about that is if you do have those, um, be very honest and open about them um, and don't be defensive if you're, if you're asked questions about them. I mean, it, it does, if you're applying a whole bunch of different places and you have to answer uh, questions about those things all of the time that you apply it can get frustrating probably and irritating but at the same time um, you know insurance companies want to make sure that they have providers that are good quality providers in their network and so if you have someone that you know had a DWI last year um, and they're real defensive about, about answering questions with it it raises questions like is this person really ready to treat people with mental illness do they maybe need to work on their own issues for a little bit first um, so just be open and honest about what your experiences are and um, and then you'll probably have less problems. Um, and that just if you have things on your record that might be a problem, that doesn't mean you can't become credentialed. Um, usually uh, credential committees will defer to your board. So if you've had some kind of board action taken or board action against you, but you've fulfilled the requirements and it's been 
the board has granted you full unrestricted license, then that's usually what the credentialing committee will look at to determine if they're going to let you through or not. So just a couple points on that. Um, it's generally site specific, so like I said, if you change jobs um, or locations, you, you may have to reapply and you just want to make sure to do that before you're termed from your first location. Um, and that's the Minnesota University change form that I sent around. Um, and then my next point, um, there are a lot of providers. There are a lot of providers, especially in the metro area. Um, so becoming credentialed is not a guarantee. Um, there, are there are insurance companies that have totally closed their networks at this point. Um, there are some that close them periodically when they get too many providers in there. So find ways to, to make yourself stand out. Um, if you're going to open up a private practice in Edina and you're going to see adults with depression, you're probably not going to be credentialed by anybody at this point because there's, you know, I don't know, 300 providers in Edina that already do that. Um, so find ways to make yourself stand out. Um, find specializations, where, whether it be um, other kinds of training or, um, you know, some kind of cultural competency or uh, working specifically with kids or with geriatric population. If you can find some kind of specialization, even if it's offering um, like crisis um, appointments or evening appointments or weekend appointments, you may have to find, depending on where you are and where your practice is going to be, you may have to find some ways that um, that make you stand out so that they, re they are excited to have you become part of their network. So that's just something to be aware of too. Um, and in that case, it's helpful to keep track of all your continuing education, any specializations, um, like if you're EMDR certified, that'd be something to keep track of so you can show you know, just keep track. Be, when you're sending in your application, I mean, you're kind of selling yourself to the insurance company, like, this is what a great provider I am. This is who I can see, and this is why, you know, you'd want to have me as part of your network. So, um, and then at the very bottom, I have read your contract <coughs> and your provider manual. Um, like everything else, these are different for each company, and there's specific information in your provider manu manual um, about what, there's important stuff in there. So, although, it kind of stings to have to sit down and read a big provider manual once you become part of a, a network. Um, there may be important things in there about, you know, chart audits or uh, maybe they re recoup money if you can't provide certain records um, going back five years. You know, there's things in there that are important that you need to be aware of. So that would be my next tip is read your provider manual. Okay. So we're going to move on to talking about prior So prior authorizations. Um, every company has different requirements. Well, yeah. Can I ask a question about preemption? Sure, yes. Yeah. A general question. Yeah. Uh, just in the ballpark, any idea about how many people apply and how many people receive it? Like percentage wise, is it like 5% um, apply, receive it? No, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I can only speak from the company that I work for. That's, that's the only real knowledge I have about how many people get through. I mean, I would say that on average, we probably get a week, we probably get between 10 and 20 new applications for providers. And I would say that um, up till now, I would say probably 80% of them got through. Um, and the ones that didn't get through, it was basically because there was not a business need. Um, they were in the middle of St. Paul. And, you know, I mean, it, it's a lot of it is about location and about specialization. So the ones that don't get through, it's almost always because there's already 10 or 20 or 50 other providers in the same area that they are providing services. Um, that already do that, so there's no need for us to add another provider. Um, I know that some companies are changing it now where they're going to start paying the application fee for providers that are going through credentialing. So my assumption, and that's the case with, with the company that I work for, so I mean, to be blunt, if we're paying the fee to bring people into our network, um, we're going to make sure that there's definitely a need for them and that there's some way that, you know, that we have clients that need that kind of service that they can provide. Um, so that's what I would say. Yeah. That kind of answers part of my question is why why does a payer care whether there's ten or twenty or a hundred providers in a region? Why not just include everyone who wants to be able to serve their clients? That's a good question. Um, and the reason I would say, I mean, there's a couple reasons. The first is just um, uh, like a if we're paying for someone to become credentialed and there's already 50 providers that we have in an area that do the same thing, why would we pay for them to be? So there's the cost associated with credentialing, so why yep. bother to do that? Yep. Okay. And there's also, um, there's also, I mean, the company that I work for, um, 
I mean, we have certain providers that will set aside times for us, that will do good things for us. If we flood an area of providers with, if we flood an area that already has providers with new providers, that's taking away business from providers that we've worked with for years. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, there is a little bit of loyalty to providers that have provided openings for us or whatever the reason may be. And we don't necessarily, and if we feel like they're good quality providers, we don't necessarily want to take business away from them either, so. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I always wondered that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an address? Can you get credentials <coughs> in those conditions? Um, if you have an address um, and an NPI number, mm -hmm. does everybody know what an NPI number is? Mm -hmm. um, if you have an address and an NPI number and you have your business stuff all set up and you have the the tax form, the, I forget what the tax form is, the, some kind of tax form that you have to show, um, and if you have your, I mean, if you have everything ready to go, but you don't actually have clients yet, then yeah, you can become credentialed, mm -hmm. as long as you're licensed. What's an NPI? Um, an NPI number, it's a national, I forget what stands for, provider. national provider identification. Um, every, every provider has to have an NPI number if they're going to be billing services. Um, and there is a website, I think it's in the resources, um, and every provider has to get one of these. It's basically like a uniform or universal provider identification number. And so like um, for the clients that we see that are UCARE clients, they might be set up in UCARE system with their own special provider ID number, but that's linked to their NPI number, and it is for every single company. So, yeah. I wanted to ask about the license part. Do you, do you have an LAMFT get credential, or do you have to be an LFM? No, you have to be licensed independently um, in order to become credentialed. So you have to be able to be reimbursed by the insurance company for them to credential you. They're not going to credential someone that they can't reimburse. So if you're an LAMFT, that means you can't work independently yet, or you can't be reimbursed by the insurance company, they will not credential you. You have to be the LMFT or an LICSW or... But if you're an LAMFT, can you work in a clinic with other LMFT that has a lot of LMFT? Yes, you can work in a clinic under supervision of someone that is licensed, um, and then they would be responsible for the, you know, the claims would all be paid under their name, and they would be responsible for supervising you, um, and you just have to make sure that whoever's supervising you is credentialed with the people that you're seeing. That makes sense. So is it the same with the LPC and the LPCC? Yes. I think some commercial insurance plans do credential LPCs, um, but the, the government insurance or the state-run insurances do not will not recognize the LPC, but they do the LPCC. So. Yeah. One last question on, um, if an LMFT was supervising somebody you know, beneath them, let's say an LAMFT, yep. uh, what would work for supervision? Is it one hour for one hour? No, it's not that. Um, DHS has their own supervision requirements, um, and I want to say it's, and they just changed them to, it's like one hour per X number of hours of treatment. I don't remember how many, do you know? 20 hours? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. For insurance providers? Or an insurance company will do that? Well, that's the, like if, if you were supervising someone that was an LMA, LAMFT and um, you, the, we came out to audit you, we would want to see evidence of supervision for one hour for every 20 hours of service oh, that was done. Okay. So that's what you're trying to do. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. If I wanted to find out what companies took which licenses, would it be on their website? Yep. Or it should be on their website. Yep. And some of the websites, even the website of the company I work for can be really hard to navigate through and find specific pieces of information. Um, so if you can maybe try calling or if you can get a contact of, uh, at the insurance company, someone that you can ask questions of, that's a good way to do it too rather than trying to find it all on your own. Or if you can f talk to a provider that's maybe already contracted with them and see if they have any helpful tips or advice of um, who to talk to or where to find the information you need. Yeah. Hi. The uh, LAMFT <coughs> provided by the LAMFT. I have a high level of all the letters. Yeah. Um, I believe... Can the LA can the LMFT build the same rate? Um, the the hours of the LAMFT? The, if it's under supervision, it's billed usually with modifiers, and I believe the rate is a little bit different than if the LMFT was providing them the services themselves. It depends on the payer, too. It, yeah, it depends on the payer, too. Yeah. 
I mean, there, it's, like I said, we haven't even hardly talked about anything, and I feel like there's already, you know, so many questions. There's so much stuff to learn out there, um, you know, so if you can start out with generals and move your way to more specifics, um, the more you learn, the better, I think, the better off you'll be. And I think, too, with um, super, supervision requirements, I believe that, um, like, a master's level person can't supervise a PhD student. Like, a PhD student can only be supervised by another PhD student. There's, there's rules about that, too. So, talking about some prior authorization. Um, and this, like I said, with other things, this is done differently for every company that's out there. And so, my goal, if, say, I was going to move into some kind of private practice, what I would do, um, and what I think is probably the most useful, is find a way to track what those differences are for the different insurance companies so that you might have a folder that's UCARE. So when you pull out that folder, it tells you what the requirements are, it tells you who, the, who your contact is, it tells you what some limitations are. Um, find ways to keep track of the differences between the different companies um, and use, you know, use that to your advantage so you don't have to think every time you have a UCARE client, you know, oh shoot, how do I get authorization for this person? And then you have to try and call and, you know, if you can find a way to keep track of it beforehand, that's the best way to do. Um, in Minnesota, for, like I said, all the state-funded insurances, those generally almost always have to follow to the rules of DHS. Um, so starting out by getting familiar with the rules of DHS is usually a really good way um, to do health services. So if you go to Chapter 16 and look at Mental Health Services Overview, and I'll pass these around too, um, it outlines the overview, the overview of the chapter outlines for all the different services that can be provided what the rules and regulations are. So it outlines for you know, adult crisis services, for diagnostic assessments, for targeted case management, for day treatment. Um, it outlines specifically what all the rules and requirements are. And then the one that talks specifically about psychotherapy, um, it talks about who's eligible. Um, it talks about um, some of the different codes, what the, the requirements are for those. Um, it talks about how often you need to update your progress notes or what has to be contained in a progress note. Um, how often you need to update your treatment plan. Um, and it also talks about, it gives you a list of different billing and CPT codes. Um, so DHS um, has a lot of really helpful information and it's usually a good place to start. Um, so that's a good, good place to start is just learning the DHS rules and requirements because usually, like I said, commercial insurance plans are gonna be less restrictive than DHS is. So if you know the DHS ones, um, it's usually easier than to just figure out what the commercial ones are kind of on your own. Um, and then in terms of forms and tracking, I came up, um, one of the packets that's back there, um, I came up with a number of different forms that um, if I was going to go into private practice that I would use myself. So these should be in one of the packets that's back there. Um, I came up with um, a general insurance company information form. So like I would have one of these for every in different insurance company. Um, like if, uh, for example, you care, it has their main phone number, their main fax number, their website. Um, and then it has a contract for credentialing, a contact for billing, a contact for authorizations, a contact for benefit questions, so that you have and you can keep track of who do I need to talk to with this company if I have a claim that's denied, or who do I need to talk to if um, I'm not getting the services authorized. If you keep it in a nice, you know, easy to access place, you can just pull it out every time you have a UCARE client and look and see. And then also on this I put in um, a couple other things like benefit information. So like for say um, preferred one, if they don't cover family therapy, you could note that in there. Anything that you'd want to keep track of in terms of what services are limited or, or not allowed. Um, and then the next box is authorization information. So like some companies will allow you to get 20 sessions up front, but then after that you have to send in the Minnesota Universal Treatment Plan form. Well if you keep track of that on your own form, then you'll know you know, what you need to do to get authorization. Um, does everyone have these? Did everyone grab these? <coughs> you see in your files and stuff? Yep, yep. At the top it says insurance company. So, I mean, just take a look through it. You can see kind of what some of the things that I thought might be helpful to providers to keep track of, like what's the out of network or continuity of care authorization policy. Um, other notes about this company, like for example, they always want information about coordination of care, or they always require measurable goals or something like that. As you start to get authorizations from different companies, you may run into some companies where they always want to see, um, excuse me, they always want to see family involvement. They always want to see coordination of care. Um, there's different, different companies specify different things that they want emphasized in their treatment plans. So if you're filling out a treatment plan for a UCARE member and you know that UCARE is really um, 
passionate about coordination of care, well then you make sure you document that on your treatment plan because if you don't, then they're gonna ask you about it and then it's gonna hold up the process. So if you can just keep, find ways to keep track of what different companies are looking for, it'll help you get through the authorization process quicker. Um, and then the last thing I put on here are what are the other services that this company can help me get um, referrals for. So, um, for example, um, the company that I work for, we, we authorize all behavior services, all levels of care. So probably on a daily basis, I'll get a call from a provider saying, um, I have a client that I think needs a CD assessment. Where can they go? Um, or I have a client that I think needs a case manager. Who can I refer them to? Um, so if you know for different insurance companies, this company will help me find CD assessments or they'll help me find um, day treatment or you know, keep track of what other things that they can help you find your clients, uh, what other kinds of services they can help you find for your clients. Um, that way if you need, you're in a situation where you need to do something or need to help a client find a referral, you can make one call to the insurance company or the MCO and say, where can I go? And they'll give you the network providers and um, you know, that can be another good resource for, for people. Um, the other kinds of forms that I had come up with were um, like a claim and off problem tracker. So if you have a situation where your claims aren't being paid or your authorization isn't going through, keep track of um, who you called and who you talked to. Like the examples I put are call to change on 90806 to 90808. Talk to, to Allison at, at extension 334. Um, and then resolution. So that way if you have um, things that are outstanding that you need to get changes made on or um, you know, claims questions that you're calling about, keep track of who you talk to and what the outcome is, um, and that way you keep track of what things have been resolved and what haven't, um, instead of just letting them kind of float around out there um, unresolved. Um, another important thing, yeah? There are these private uh, billing companies. Do they do this? Some of them do. Um, some of them will keep track of this stuff for you. Um, some of them won't. Um, I think there's some now websites um, I forget what some of them are called, but there's websites that will help you um, track things like treatment planning and they'll do your claims for you. I mean, there's, there's online services that can help you do this stuff too. Um, so there's lots of resources out there. Um, but I think if you have kind of a general knowledge going into it, even if you have a, a company doing it for you, at least you kind of know where things are at. Would they, or, would, I mean, would they go as far as, as calling you when you haven't received no, I, I think that some of them do. I think, I mean, there's lots of clearinghouses for claims payment. Um, and I think, um, you know, the level of service that you get from those is probably different depending on, you know, who you pick. And, I mean, they might have different kinds of, or different levels of um, interaction or different levels of service depending on what you, how much you pay them or, you know what I mean? I think they're, you could pay more and get, a, get people to do more for you or pay less and just have them do the claims, like, but you might have to still do some of the, the calling and the, the problem solving and stuff like that. Um, and then the other thing I'd come up with, um, and really these forms took me like 10 minutes to come up with. Like if I just thought if I was a private practice pr practitioner and I needed to keep track of this, this is what I would want to have no matter what. Um, and so for whatever way works for people to keep track of things and keep themselves organized, um, I think if you can find a way to do it, it'll be a lot better. Um, the other thing I made up was a referral resource form. So like for psychiatry, well, I want to know who I can refer my clients to if they need a medication evaluation. Um, so if I know like Dr. Johnson takes health partners clients, but he doesn't take you care clients, I'd probably note that in here, you know, or Dr. Johnson sees children, but not adults. Then I know if I have a client that I want to make a referral to, I can kind of keep track of that kind of thing too. So that's just some ideas about how to how to keep things organized and how to keep on getting a fire authorization or filling out a treatment plan. Um, there's a couple things to keep in mind and not every um, <coughs> company requires the same forms. Um, some of them, like I think Blue Cross now requires a, like a wellness check at the beginning or at relatively at the beginning of treatment, but they don't require an actual treatment plan form. <coughs> UBH, okay. <laughs> But there, there's different things. So you're not always going to be filling out a treatment plan, but generally you're going to be filling out something that indicates what you're doing um, and how you're serving the client that you're seeing. So these are things to keep in mind um, in terms of that. Okay, so um, all the reviewing team is going to see is what you document. I mean, you, the, for the clients that are your clients, you know them, you know what you're doing with them, um, but what you send into the insurance company, they don't know any of that. All they see is what is on the piece of paper that you send to them. So if you document that the client's suicidal, 
um, but you don't document any kind of safety plan or you don't document that maybe they've had a medication evaluation, the, the reviewers that see that aren't going to know that. So when they ask you questions about it later, you know, try not to be upset, just think of it as a learning opportunity. Okay, these people always want to see that there's a safety plan or these people always want to see that there's been a medication evaluation. You know, um, when, when reviewers are asking questions of providers, um, at least in my experience, it's not meant to be um, punitive, it's not meant to put you down or make you think that you're a bad provider. It's, you know, we're contracted to look out for the clients. So if we see that there's a child in treatment and there's no family involvement, well, we're going to ask why that is. Or if we see a client that has, you know, bipolar disorder and they've never had a medication evaluation or there's nothing indicated, we're going to ask why that is. I mean, the patient can refuse, but we want to at least know that it's been offered and that it's been talked about. Um, so just keep in mind what you send to the insurance company, they are looking at that and that alone to make their decision about whether or not to authorize more services. Um, so give a complete snapshot. Um, and you don't have to, to recreate the wheel. I mean, the Minnesota Universal Plan, and I put a copy um, in one of the handouts that I sent. I mean, it's a one-page form. There's a lot of stuff on there. It gets kind of squished and hard symptoms to your measurable goals and to your interventions. So if your symptoms talk about you know, anxiety, but your goals talk about depression, well, that doesn't really add up or make sense. You know. Um, and I did also in the packet that has the treatment plans, um, if you guys have that, I just real quickly filled out a couple of these treatment plans with some of the things that you might, that we have seen or that might be a problem. Problem, yes, but that's nowhere addressed in the treatment goals or in the other provider section, you know. So if there's pieces missing, um, you know. Did you have I'm just looking at the GAF. The GAF, yep. In relation to the diagnosis. And the symptoms. And yep, and that's a, big, that's a big one. Unfortunately, the GAF is a pretty, I, I mean, it's, it's a subjective score. Um, it's not a perfect science. So if I were looking at this as a reviewer, would I ask questions about it? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but we're just looking to make sure that all the pieces are addressed and that, um, the, that it seems appropriate for what the client, for the symptoms that the client's having. Um, if you look at the one that's, there's one that's marked patient X, and I just kind of scribbled all over it. Um, this is just meant to show, if you have bad handwriting, then, then type your stuff out. Um, please, please, because if you're writing it and you have really bad handwriting and then you fax it over to us, if we can't read what's on the treatment plan, we, you know, if we can't read what the words are, what the treatment is, we have nothing to review, basically. So just be careful about um, handwriting. Um, and a lot of, I think most companies now are moving toward um, electronic submission of treatment plans or electronic submission of authorization requests too. So a lot of it's done online now too. So is this form online and we can fill it out online and send it to the company? Um, this yet? one is, yeah. If you if you Google Minnesota Universal Treatment Plan form. And right, you can fill it out online? Yeah, yeah, you can fill it out and print it, yeah. You can't save it. You can't save it, but you no. can fill it out online and then print it. Print. And then you could scan it maybe or you can save it that way or something. But. Um, and different companies, like the, like the company that I work for, we have our forms online where you can fill them out online and then email them, um, or you could print them and fax them too. But I mean, I think most companies are moving toward trying to make it easier for providers to submit these forms and make it well legible and, and that kind of thing too. So just, yeah. After meeting the client and, and having that first appointment, how fast, how soon is this filled out? Um, that depends on the company. Um, usually, um, I mean, it's even different within the same company. Like for the company I work for, we manage for UCARE and for Preferred One. Well, UCARE has set up different initial authorization requirements than Preferred One has. So for Preferred One, and this is just real brief. I just wanted to get you guys a, a, an idea of what it's like to look at a treatment plan and think critically. Does this treatment make sense? Does it look like everything's being addressed? Because this is what the insurance companies are looking for. So if you look at the one that says John Johnson at the top, and this is all, this is just stuff I made up, it's not real clients or anything like that. Um, what, what kind of problems do you see with this treatment plan? A lot of blanks. Yep. A really high gas. Yeah. <laughs> is that a problem? Yep, that's a problem. Okay. Yep. How fast, how soon is this filled out? Um, that depends on the company. Okay, the range from what to what? Um, Usually, um, I mean, 
it's even different within the same company. Like for the company I work for, we manage for UCARE and for Preferred One. Well, UCARE has set up different initial authorization requirements than Preferred One has. So for Preferred One, we'll give you 20 sessions up front. So you have 20 sessions before you have to send in the treatment plan. For UCARE, they get 20 sessions a year, but that's member specific, it's not provider specific. So if they've seen someone for 20 sessions and then they come to you for their first session, well, they've already used their free sessions for the year. So you'd have to send it in right away. Okay. So it really depends. I, I would contact. Is there any bad surprise that it's like you've seen them for three or four or five sessions in order to develop some realistic ideas? Yep. Um, that's where it's really important to know what the requirements of each different company is. Um, most companies cannot deny, most companies have to authorize retro services, like because we're reviewing for medical necessity. Yep, if we would have approved the service at the time that it was done, we can't deny it just because it's retrospective. Um, so that, but there might be some companies that don't do it that way. That's been my experience, but most companies have some kind of retro authorization policy where they'll allow, um, you know, up to six months or up to a year that you can request services for. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What if a client comes in and you do the assessment and it doesn't meet the criteria for a diagnosis? Or it's just vetoed? You can get authorization for the assessment. Okay. For the diagnostic assessment, I believe you can bill those with a V code or without a code at all or with like a 799 code. Um, but you wouldn't be able to get authorization for treatment. Yeah. But you should always be able to get an authorization then, for an could assessment. And they still come and pay out of pocket? Sure. Yep. Yep. If, you have, if you're doing private pay, um, I mean, aside from the rules of what your board is, you can, I think, pretty much do anything you want, um, as long as it's not harmful to the client or, you know. Yeah. What's the policy if the, you know, it often happens that the company that the client works for changes their health insurance company mm -hmm. at a certain point yeah. in the year? What is, what's the policy mm -hmm. with insurance companies if the provider is not a provider for the insurance company that they go to? Most companies um, should have some kind of continuity of care policy. Um, for our company, or for UCARE, I should say it's 120 days that you have 120 days where you can see the client for 20 up to 20 sessions and that gives you time to either apply to become a provider or transition the client to an in-network provider. Um, but that's something else that's different with every company. Um, that's why I put it on my form, out-of-network authorizations or continuity care authorizations. Because that can happen and sometimes you don't find out um, until you've already seen them for you know five sessions on their new insurance. Um, so, yeah. Yeah? Um, to the best of your knowledge, is there any potential for negative repercussions to the client by, based on what's on the treatment plan? Like, for instance, if the if risk for like suicidal tendencies or homicide or something, but then it's checked like decline to contract or something like that, is there any potential that that can then like that the um, in, the payer may decline coverage for them? Um, not in my experience, no. Okay. There's not. Um, there might be a lot of phone calls to the provider saying you need to contract with this person for safety or we need to get them in a higher level of care. Okay. Um, but there wouldn't be like payment issues for or authorization issues. Okay. That's been my experience. I know that a lot of people think that um, diagnoses can follow people around. Um, and I think that that's true depending on certain circumstances. But, you know, the information that we get is confidential. We can't share it with other people unless there's releases or. Um, you know, if it's a court order treatment, we might have to share information with the court um, and that kind of thing. But really, even though we're a third party, um, doing third party authorizations, we're still, um, you know, we're still bound by confidentiality and that kind of thing. And we would never punish a, a client for what a provider did or didn't include in their treatment plan. We might, you know, have a lot of problems with the provider, um, but we try to always look out for the client and make sure that they're, you know, Whatever is taken care of. If they change providers, if you were to go as an uh, out of network provider, yep. all, would all the insurance companies pay something? Or does it vary with the company? It varies with the company. Um, and there are some companies where you can get an out of network authorization, but you can get a benefit exception to have it covered at the highest level. So you can be out of network, but still getting coverage as if you were in network. Um, that's something that we have to do at times. Um, but there are some, I think, that have, um, well, and there are some health plans that have no out-of-network benefits whatsoever. Um, you know, so it really depends on what their benefits are and who the company is. Um, that's why another reason why it would be important to keep track of that. 
you know, that kind of stuff. Um, my next one on the PowerPoint was don't be offended by questions. Um, and I think I talked a little bit about this already, but if, 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 a, if a reviewer from an insurance company is asking you questions, um, like I said, it's not that they're trying to accuse you of being a bad provider, they're just trying to make sure that everything's in place for the client. Um, it's not meant to be punitive or um, as a put down. It's, we're, you know, we're hired to make sure that the client is receiving comprehensive quality care, so if you don't document, you know, if you document something that doesn't make sense and we ask about it, that doesn't mean we think you're a bad provider, we're just trying to get clear on questions. Um, you know, try to keep an open mind about it. Um, my next point is coordinate care. Um, I think this is pretty much universally um, something that's desired or wanted by all different insurance companies is they want you to coordinate care with the primary care physician, with the psychiatrist or the prescriber, um, with social workers. Um, coordinate care with as many people as you think is appropriate for the people that you're seeing. Um, and coordination of care usually means that you're making an effort to coordinate. So you might be sending a letter to a primary care physician notifying them of who you're seeing and what their diagnosis is. You probably won't hear back from them, but at least you've made the effort to reach out. So coordination of care doesn't necessarily mean that there's a back and forth. I think that's ideal, but as long as you're making the effort, most companies will consider that coordination of care, and that's good enough. Um, and then the last one on this slide, um, there are bad providers. There are corrupt providers, and that's probably the main reason that um, there are managed care organizations and that there's all these rules and guidelines in place. Um, me personally, I mean, I think that probably 98% of the providers that are out there are great providers. They do a good job. Um, a lot of times they don't tell us that in their documentation, but as we ask questions or as we do chart audits, we can see that they're doing all the things that they should be and that they're providing good care to their clients. But there are providers that, um, you know, do billing fraud, that don't treat their clients well, um, you know, and that's why insurance companies are there and that's why managed care is there. Um, and so although it's in a way kind of making it harder for all providers to get authorizations, um, there's reasons usually for all the rules and regulations that are in place. It's usually because at some point a provider tried to get away with something or do something, so then there had to be a rule put in place so that providers know they can't do that. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, just real quickly, some of the most common problems that we see in treatment plans. Um, first, that they're incomplete. Like I said, if you don't fill out a part of the treatment plan, there's probably going to be questions or it's probably going to hold up the authorization process. Um, treatment plans that are late. Um, if you send in a treatment plan late, that means that you know, a portion of care has already been done, so if there's any issues or problems with the care or any questions that we have, we're not getting a chance to ask it up front before the care is provided, um, and it just kind of makes things messy. Um, diagnoses listed don't match the current symptoms, so you might have a diagnosis of depression, but symptoms are anxiety or something totally different. Um, um, the next highest problems are documented, like suicidal ideation or chemical dependency issues um, with no corresponding treatment goals related to them. Um, fam family planning is not documented. Um, coordination of care is not documented. The gap is too high or too low. Um, the symptoms themselves don't measure or don't match up with what the treatment goals are. Um, the goals are not measurable or the goals are not specific. Um, those are usually the most common things that would cause a treatment plan to be held up or to take the review process to go longer. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit more about, uh, say, for depression, what, what, what would be a measure of the For depression? Mm -hmm. um, there, it it kind of depends on what the symptoms are. If you have a client that is clinically depressed and say they're, um, they're crying, they're not sleeping at night, they're eating too much, um, they're socially isolated. Well, if you make, the, the easiest way I think to do it is if you make your, um, as you're listing your symptoms, kind of make them measurable. So you might put a symptom, the client is crying on average four times a week, or the client um, only gets an average of four hours of sleep a night, or the client um, hasn't seen her friends for a week. You know, then you're already, with your symptoms, you're already putting some kind of measure on there or some kind of number, so then your goal could be um, to make it measurable, it just has to have like a frequency or a duration. So your goal could be reduce crying from episodes from four times a week to one time a week. Or it could be client will reach out and talk to a friend um, at least one time per day. You know what I mean? Just adding something for that's some kind of number or duration, that's what we're looking for so that as we get the different treatment plans, as the client proceeds through treatment, we could look back at the first treatment plan and say, oh, they were crying four times a week, now they're only crying you know, not at all. That's not even a treatment goal anymore because they're not doing it anymore. You know what I mean? So that it's something so we can kind of see um, where the client's going or make it some kind of 
You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Could you also just use <coughs> the PHQ? Sure. PHQ by 20%? Yep. Some people use PHQ. Some people use like the, the BDI or the, the BAI, um, the score on that. Yep. Those are, those are really easy ways to make it measurable. Um, next, um, how to fill out the treatment plan form. Um, fill out the whole thing. We already talked about that. Contact the managed care organization if you have questions. Don't try to guess. Um, I, think, I think I said this earlier, but one of the biggest problems is providers that try, for example, um, LPCCs, LNFTs cannot see Medicare clients. It's a Medicare rule and regulation. It has to be an LICSW um, or a, a doctoral level um, LP. Those are the only people that are reimbursed for seeing Medicare clients. So just keep, keep that in mind when you're um, seeing clients and when you're submitting billing. Um, and the other thing I wanted just to just point out is that um, even after you're paid for an insurance company, they can take money back from you. Um, if they do a chart audit and you can't provide progress notes for sessions, they may take money back. Or if your progress notes don't match up with the code that you build, they might take that money back or, or have you pay it back. So, and that should all be in the, the provider contract that you have. It's just something to be aware of once you've been paid. It doesn't mean they can't come back and, and um, take that money back if you can't prove that you did the service. Um, um, this is something that I thought was interesting, just the top six reasons that claims are denied or uh, payers reject or, de or uh, delay claims. Um, you can read them through. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and when you get claims that are denied or when you get a, an explanation of benefits showing that a, a payment is denied, um, you know, d be quick about it. Start asking questions right away. Why was this denied? What do I need to do to get it fixed? Um, it's kind of a messy system overall, but I think the electronic claims payment is helping some of the, the claims get through quicker. I think that's kind of been a good thing, um, but it's something that you just need to make sure to keep on top of. Is that for each company, or is there a universal site online that you can There's um, clearinghouses that, that will do the claim submission for you. Um, so like if you're even a, a private practice, you could do it yourself online through different websites, or you could hire a, a company that will do it for you. But I, my understanding is that everything has to be electronic now. It's not an option, so. Um, okay, then just some additional <coughs> advice. Um, things that I think that a provider should always have. Um, first would be a CPT code book or a uh, HCPCS book. Um, and I just brought one from, grabbed one from my work. This is a C CPT code book. It's from 2006, but they don't change that much. It has a list of all the different potential um, codes, um, what they are. Um, you know, it's a real helpful resource if you're doing, you know, you're seeing a client for 90 minutes and the family was there for part of it and you want to figure out what's the best way that I can get reimbursed for this. You could look in here and find, well, what's a code for a 90 minute session or what's the code for a, an interactive session or, you know, it's a good resource to have and just look through. Um, most of the psychotherapy billing codes are on the DHS website, which is the hand, one of the handouts that got printed around or sent around. Um, another helpful thing is a list of, did I just ask that? Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> um, other helpful things would be a list of county contacts or county numbers. Um, this I just printed off the DHS website. It's like 27 pages long, but it lists for each county um, what their phone number is, what their fax number is, what their website is, their email. So that way if you're seeing a client that lives in any county and you need to make a child protection report or you want to find out what kind of housing resources are, are available for a client, this is a real handy thing to have. Um, and this I just pulled out the DHS website. It's a list of um, a couple other things that you might want to have um, that would be handy. Um, would be, um, okay, um, a list of transportation resources. So if you have a client that um, doesn't have a car, um, some health plans provide transportation um, through like a health ride or um, there's always like metro mobility. An option. So just have maybe a list of resources. So if you have a client that doesn't have a car um, and doesn't normally use the bus or isn't used to using the bus that you can give them, you know, it's a helpful thing to have. Um, a list of other resources like um, food shelves, um, places where people can go and get information about housing. These are all things that it probably would be helpful for you to have just as a resource if, if you have a client that is losing their house or is getting divorced and needs to move somewhere but they don't have, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the last thing I had on there is a list of who to contact should you need to escalate insurance issues. Um, so if you are working with an insurance company and you feel like it's really unfair and there's tons of problems, 
Um, you can talk to the insurance commissioner. You can talk to the state of Minnesota. Um, those are other things that would be helpful to know who you can contact if you feel like things uh, would be helpful to you. Um, the first is that they can make referrals to you. Um, and this is different with each company too, but like for uh, the company that I work for, we have an online scheduling system where providers can set aside time so that we can send clients to them and make referrals to them. So that's one thing that you can get from insurance companies is more clients. Um, you can get clinical advice from um, insurance companies and managed care organizations. They all have some kind of license review staff, um, and more often than not, if you have a question about a client, about where they can go or um, what to do with them, you can call and ask those reviewers to help you or give you some advice about, in their experience, maybe what's a good way to handle the situation. Um, and then the last thing is referrals for other services. Um, like I said before, if you have a client that needs a CD assessment or you want to refer a client for arm services or um, medication management or any of those things, um, a good insurance company or MCO will be able to tell you where you can send that client that's in network and is, would be a good fit for the client. So there are ways that insurance companies can be helpful to you as well um, and not just a barrier. Yeah. How can you get a copy, how can you get a copy of the suit to people? Um, I, um, we just order them off a website every year. There's a, I don't know if it's on the book, but they have a website like CPT coding something.com and they just they, they print new ones every year. So if you just do a, a search for a CPT clip up, you'd be able to find it. Right. Um, are those industry like standard CPT codes? Are What's those that? standard? Yeah. Across the industry? Yes. Yeah. It looks like there's only like three pages for psychiatric stuff, so I mean I didn't see it in another section there because it's all medicine. Like, um, could we somehow just get all of those pages? Yeah, the, um, one of the handouts from DHS has a list of the common psychotherapy codes, which is what most of what's on those pages. Um, if you're, depending on what kind of <coughs> service you're providing, you may get into some more complicated billing, like um, health and behavior codes that are a little bit different, or the HICPIC codes, those are codes that start with H. Those can be a little bit different. Um, so, you know, there's different ways to do it, but the most common used codes are gonna be on the DHS website. Um, That. And then the rest of it, which is on the website, this is the DHS website, which I get tons of information from. Um, you can sign up with the website to get uh, updates or um, get their newsletters, and that way you keep track of what changes they're making and what, what things are different. Um, and then also included on the copy of the PowerPoint, there's a website for CMS, which is the Center for uh, Medicaid. It's like Medicaid and Medicare, um, if you need information about those. <coughs> A couple different um, insurance company websites, including UBH, MHP, Health Partners, um, and then we already talked about the forms. Um, and that's pretty much it. Sorry about all the handouts, but like, there's just so much information I know. Current insurance companies in Minnesota. So this lists the different insurance companies, and then I put the websites. Um, if anyone wants to, I can give out my email address too. If anyone wants me to email them a copy of this presentation with the links right on there, I'd be more than happy to do that. Would you like that? Okay. Yeah. Would you be willing to share your insurance company form? For yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. That'll be in the, I can send that to, or it's part of the form for it. So, I mean, if it's going to be helpful in any way, I'd say go for it. I mean, like I said, I, you know, it seems to be this really painful thing for insurance companies to try to work together. And it, I don't really think it has to be. And I think insurance companies are doing, you know, the, the work they're doing, it has a purpose. Whether or not providers agree with managed care as, as a concept, um, if they have to work with it, they can do it in a way that's not painful. Um, my email um, is Jennifer Trumbull, T-R-U-M-B-L-E, at So if you want me to send you a copy of the PowerPoint, just shoot me an email and I'll mail you back with a copy of it. And if you have questions that come up, feel free to ask me. Um, I think the more the providers know, the better the better it is for both the, the MCO and for the providers. And I don't think that we're necessarily working at opposite. You know, I think we can work together. I think we have a lot of the same goals. And in my experience, the people that work at managed care organizations um, are very passionate about behavioral health. They're very passionate about coordination, coordination of care. Um, they don't want to deny care. They don't want to be barriers just to make sure that the client that they're looking after is seeing a good provider that's helping them and that all the aspects of treatment are in place. So that's kind of my little soapbox for the day. Are there any other questions about any of this or? Yeah. 
I came late, but I think you did an excellent job, and I think it would be cool if you could do presentations, like, you know, wherever they were necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, um, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that people need to get out. And, thank you very much. Anyone else have questions or anything? Yes, there's an evaluation. There's a couple of evaluation forms. I think one is for the alumni association and one is for the for my master's project. Uh, uh, showing that I did a presentation and getting the feedback. So if you guys can fill those out and just turn them into patches. Right, next question.